I was very lucky to get the job with a, a CIO who knew about these things and wanted to do this. So I went into the job interview there and basically I splurted out about extreme programming. This is the way I want to work. I think it's going to be fantastic and kind of got halfway through the interview and I was thinking, well, have I just ruined my chances here? And luckily, he just kind of turned around and said, well, yeah, that's exactly what we want to hear because that's, that's exactly what we want to do. That is Rob Bailey, a senior technical architect over at Make Positive. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. There, Rob is talking about his experience getting a job where he got to be passionate about extreme programming and other things like unit testing. And today, we're going to sit down with Rob. We're going to talk about unit testing. We're going to talk about mocking. And we're going to talk about Rob's own framework, Amos. But where we start is how on apparently a very, very nerdy level, Rob and I are mortal enemies. I started coding uh, when I was about six or seven, the story goes, on a Commodore PET Mm. So quiet a long time ago. Uh, but then when I went through school, I decided I wanted to be an architect. And so I went off to university and studied architecture for three years, then came out the back of that and realized I'd have to do a lot more study and I still wouldn't get paid an awful lot. And friends at university were doing electronic engineering and computer science. And uh -huh. I just sort of realized that that was something that I was already good at and that I could switch into. So yeah, I had the opportunity to stay on at university and do my master's in computer science and yeah, got into work pretty soon after that. And that's, you know, more than 20 years ago now. <laughs> It's okay. I think on another episode, I mentioned one of my first computing experiences with, was on a TI-99. <laughs> uh, and I spent a good deal of my formative years in computing on a Commodore 64. So you're in good company with vetting how long you've been doing yeah, you say that. I'm, I'm, I was a ZX Spectrum guy. I don't think we should talk oh. to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you had an Amiga as well, didn't you? I'm going to confess, I had several Amigas. <laughs> oh, no, we're more enemies then. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, it looks like you have a lot of experience in Oracle and PHP. How did you get into the Salesforce ecosystem? Yeah, I was working uh, at, I worked for a long time at one company and we we built on on Oracle uh, and PHP, JavaScript, mm -hmm. and uh, they were looking to go into the cloud. It, the systems that we put together had been in place for sort of 11, 12 years, uh, and were still holding up really well. But they they had this idea that they wanted to actually make a, uh, a package up what they'd, they'd already built and then see if they could sell that on. There was, it wasn't really hmm. a goer, and Salesforce was an a real good choice for them to do that. So hmm. uh, I was running in the development team at that point, and we moved over to Salesforce and cross-trained everybody at that point. So everybody in the development team had been working in PHP and Oracle for, I guess, like seven, eight, nine years each, oh, wow. probably. Uh, we had some Siebel developers as well, so they, they transitioned at the same time. And as I came out the back of that, I, I managed that team for sort of two or three years after we moved into Salesforce, and I decided I wanted to move back into development myself. Management was something that which worked for me, but wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't a passionate sort of thing. So when I started looking for jobs as I came out of that, rather than looking for Oracle and PHP, I I looked at Salesforce because it just seemed to make a lot of business sense. And mm. I admit there is definitely. As a as an aging developer, there are there are things about Salesforce I don't enjoy. It's <laughs> it's not the nicest of development environments as a as a pure techie developer. Uh -huh. But it just makes so much business sense that it's it's really really hard to ignore. And some of the stuff that you do get for free just means that a lot of the the really dull stuff you just don't ha ever have to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's a real kind of love hate thing with Salesforce. I think. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's interesting to say that because I definitely hear that a lot from Java developers who are kind of used to being able to build their own castle and then kind of live in it. What was the transition like between going from, for instance, from PHP to Apex and maybe not just for you, but like for your team, like eight years of PHP is a decent backbone in that language. Yeah, absolutely. And I think 
we were really helped by the way we approached PHP because mm. PHP it has a reputation as being a very scripty language. I mean, it's a mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. an interpreted language. You don't tend to compile it unless you're doing things pretty serious, and it has a lot of similarities with with JavaScript in terms of certainly back then in the mm-hmm. sorts of things you can do. It's very it's dynamically typed. It's very weakly typed. So. But if you, unless you want to, you don't have to do an awful lot of the kinds of things that you have to do with Java. And yeah. so it can be very succinct in its code. But the way we approached PHP was we always wanted to do things in a very rigorous way. And so mm. f- right from day one uh, in, that, in the company that I was working for, we pair programmed and we used unit testing. And this was back mm. in sort of 2003, 2004. So unit testing was was up and running, but it wasn't really that common. So I think yeah. like 2003, 2000, it was probably even a couple of years before that. <laughs> um, yeah, so when we, we we approached PHP, we still approached it with the kind of rigor that you would have to use for a strongly typed language, even though it wasn't really on vogue at the time. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really mm-hmm. what everybody else was doing. And part of that was building um, sort of scripting engines for for doing automated testing. So it was around the time that Selenium had only just appeared. So we, at the time, we wrote a scripting language to drive IE6 through COM, and basically. So it would interpret our our user interface components, and we would uh-huh. be able to drive behavior through that, and then wrote a scripting language on top of that that meant that we could write quite straightforward user interface tests, and it was slow. I mean, it was <laughs> none of this headless browser stuff. It was, you know, right. it launched to IE6, and you could see it doing it there and then. Um, it's kind of magical, but also mm-hmm. just incredibly slow. Yeah. Um, that sort of meant that when we then moved into Salesforce and Apex, I mean, one of the first things that people got quite excited about was the idea that Salesforce were putting unit testing front and center. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the first things you learned when you picked up Apex was, mm-hmm. right, unit testing. You have to have code coverage for your unit tests, and uh, that's where you start. Uh, it came as a bit of a shock then when you kind of get into the Salesforce world and you realize that even though that's the case, I guess because people are forced into it rather than they sort of grow into it, which is which is what we'd done. Yeah. It's not necessarily front and center of the individual developers' minds in the same kind of way. So let's get into more specifics. And, and I want to center a lot of stuff around your London Colleague Talks was centered around your project emails. But before we even get into that, let's get into just some real level settings. So generically speaking, what does mocking mean in unit testing? Right. So yes, mocking is, it's a term that gets sort of banded around quite a lot and it sort of means an awful lot to a lot a lot of different people in different contexts. Mm-hmm. But essentially what it is about is when you're testing a part of the system and you need to bring in dependencies, so you need to bring in other objects into your test, instead of bringing in the real world versions of those objects, you can create test-only replicas of those so that you can divorce yourself from the dependencies on the other areas of the system. So a great example of that, and Salesforce does, does have mocking capabilities in it, so people will probably be aware of the term from the mock HTTP callout. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's pretty clear what you're doing then. When you, if you make an HTTP callout in in your unit test, it's not going to work. It uh, it kind of blanket fails, and so you have to bring in this mock HTTP callout interface, implement an object, and essentially what that does is it replaces the the HTTP communication for you, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Uh, mocking in general takes that further, and so you can apply it to any object in your system, and so you can create an instance of an object that looks like a real world class, but doesn't mm-hmm. behave like that. It mm. it tends to be a very benign thing. So it doesn't actually have any functionality of its own, right? All it will basically do is it will take an input and then it will respond then with uh, normally a predetermined set of outputs. Gotcha. And, and these, these replicas, that's what you refer to as, as test doubles. So yes, test doubles is a good term. People tend to use, as I said, said earlier, words like mock and stub and, and fake sort of interchangeably. And for me, all of those those things kind of fall under this umbrella of a test double because it makes it very clear. Right? A double is, you know, it's a replica of something mm-hmm. and it's four tests. 
Mm -hmm. uh, whereas people, if you tend to use stub, you go, oh, well, I'm just going to stub this bit out. I'm not finished building it yet, so I'm just going to stub that thing. So I'll get something that reacts. And it's a temporary thing that you can then replace later. But a test double isn't temporary. It's something that's going to live inside your tests. And then inside that, you can have sort of different behaviors. So a simple thing would be a test stub, which will just respond to uh, method calls in particular ways. So you make a call against a method, it will respond with a particular value. You give it a particular parameter, it responds with a different value. Mm -hmm. um, you can then enhance that and then uh, have an entity called a spy where it behaves just like a stub, but after it's finished doing what you've asked of it, you can then ask it, what parameters were you passed? How many times were you called? How many times was this method called? What parameters were called, mm -hmm. uh, were used in that call? And then a mock mm -hmm. is another layer on top of that, which is quite a clever piece of kit, which can then sort of self-validate. You sort of set it up to say, these methods are going to be called in this order, and they're going to be called with these parameters or parameters with these characteristics. And then after your test has run, you can then say, well, did everything happen how you expected it to? Mm, okay. And it's a very different kind of way of thinking because we tend to think of our unit test as being, well, I'm going to set up, I'm going to execute something, and then I'm going to assert that things have happened, whereas right. mocks tend to turn that a little bit around. So you create a mock and you say, I'm going to expect these things to happen, and mm. then you push the button. Gotcha. And gotcha. then it automatically checks for you that it, that, that has happened. Got it. Okay, so natively in Apex, we have the HTTP mock. And I want to say, is, is that the only thing that moves in this direction? Or are there other things that are kind of standard in the Apex language that go around what you're talking about right now? Yeah, well, one of the things that we, that as, a, as, as a developer who did a lot of unit testing early on, um, coming into Salesforce, one of the things I got really excited about when I first saw it was the idea of the stub provider. Mm. So coming back to just briefly to the PHP world, one of the great things about PHP is, uh, which is similar to JavaScript in this sense, you can just sort of build something on the fly right. and use it interchangeably. And the way it's interpreted means that uh, when I reference a class, it doesn't have to be the real version of a class that's in the system. Right. I can just kind of swap out files uh, in the background and nobody's any the wiser. I, I just import a different definition. And so you can create these, these replicas of things very easily by just sort of doing a little bit of smoke and mirrors, if you like. <laughs> and stub provider sounds very much, and in fact it is, very much this same sort of implementation mm -hmm. just embedded within the language. And it's actually very, very powerful. Uh, so what, that, what the stub provider allows you to do is basically you, you just define a class which has a single method on it, which is uh, that handles method calls. And then you can use that to instantiate uh, an instance of any other class. And I say any other class, it has quite a lot of limitations. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, let's say we have a class DHL delivery provider. And that's got some functionality in it that communicates with DHL and says that I want to make a delivery using DHL. We don't want to use that class in our test. We want to use a replica of it. So I can inst I can create a class which implements a, a method which is going to handle all of the method calls against that provider and then that implements the stub provider interface and then i can just basically generate an object and i can tell salesforce it is this dhl delivery provider and as mm, far as mm -hmm. salesforce is concerned from that point on this object that you have in your test is a dhl delivery provider and it will behave how you tell it to but uh, it isn't the real world object. It's one of these testables. And as I say, that's baked into the language as a stub provider. And not a lot of languages have that. Everything else, it tends to be an, ex an extension or a library that you add on. Mm -hmm. and so to have that embedded in your language is, is quite a powerful thing. And I'm guessing you're not, you, you know, you just reached for the DHL provider example specifically because it sounds like the the use case for this is you you have a troublesome class that's doing things like multiple http callouts or or other things that are going to kind of create a black hole for your unit tests and here you could just kind of plug that black hole in yeah absolutely i mean you've you've said that much more succinctly than than i have absolutely <laughs> <laughs> all right so then let's move to to your project first of all 
what does AMOS stand for? So AMOS is Apex Mock Objects Spies and Stubs. Gotcha. So so the library of the things that you were just describing. Yeah, exactly. And the reason for having this is although Stub Provider is very powerful, it's actually mm -hmm. quite clunky to use. And so mm. after that immediate excitement of coming into that, wow, Salesforce has got unit testing front and center. We've got this Stub Provider. Oh, it's so hard to use. <laughs> and it really is. Because uh, what you tend to find when you, you use mocking frameworks in other languages, and I've got to be absolutely honest, Amos is not a brand new concept. This is something that exists in lots of other languages under lots of, mm. lots of different names. Okay. Uh, the thing about how you use uh, a mocking framework normally in, in lots of other languages is when you want to create one of these testables, you do it inside your test and you basically say, well, I want a double of the DHL delivery provider. And when I call this method, it's going to return this value. And when I call this method, it's going to throw an exception. Mm -hmm. And when I call this method with this parameter, I'm going to return this different value. Gotcha. And the great thing about that is uh, it's right front and center in, in your test. So as you're reading through your test, you say, right, well, this is how this is going to behave. And this is how mm -hmm. this thing's going to behave. And now I'm going to plug those things together and push the button. And yes, it does behave like that. Brilliant. Whereas what you find with stub provider is that definition of that behavior is it by its very nature, it has to be defined inside a class. And that class cannot be defined inside your method. It has to be defined elsewhere. Mm. Now, it can be inside your, your test class, so you can uh -huh. use inner classes, mm. but but it's not there. It's not <laughs> right there. And so you end up sort of jumping through hoops to get, it, to get your test readable. Mm. And that's very important. I mean, as anybody who's ever visited a unit test for the first time when it's failed, so you've <laughs> never seen this thing before, and you want to get this work finished, but why is this test failed? What is it trying to do? If right. you then have to start jumping around between lots of different classes to find out what that what the test is even trying to do, it makes it quite difficult. And so that that's really the motivation behind Amos is to to bring that back in, so that your setting up of your mock objects or your testables is right there in your test, and so it's very clear what's happening. Got it. So it's providing structure, but possibly even more importantly, it, it's providing readability so that when i look at your mock object as you were saying you you're setting up the x y and z and then pushing the button as opposed to the other way around i can easily see what that x y and z actually is yeah absolutely completely and that readability is a really vital aspect of unit testing which is which is why i wanted i wanted to write this i, I mean i'll be honest i wrote this because i wanted to use it uh, gotcha. which, you know it's always a, always a great starting point isn't it for anything yeah and the reason why I wanted to use that is because I, I want to write unit tests that can be read. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, code, code lives for a long time and it's going to be read a lot more times than you imagine it's going to be read. <laughs> As any developer who has had to go back and read their own code will it definitely attest to. Yeah, completely. So clarify a little bit more for me. You were talking about like test stubs and you're talking about test spies and I'm not actually going to confess here i think i think in like prepping for this interview test this was the first time i'd really seen the concept of a test spy so like compare and contrast those two concepts for me like what does one do versus the other and what you know what's what's their pros and cons and their strengths and weaknesses yeah okay uh so a stub is a fairly straightforward entity so it's a mm -hmm. testable that has the least amount of functionality okay you can imagine mm -hmm. it really does just have an interface that you can call, so it has methods that you can call, and they're going to respond with particular values. Mm -hmm. And in general, what you use a stub for is purely for directing a test down a particular path. Okay. So it might be that you want to get some data from, from the database, and uh -huh. so you use a, a data source or a selector in the um, financial force library terminology. <laughs> um, and your stub is a replica of your data source, only it, re it just returns particular records for you. They gotcha. don't have to be in the database. It just, you know, I want to get a list of six products. It just returns you back six products. Got it. And, and that's that. A spy will do that. Uh, so it's got all the capabilities of the stub. It's mm -hmm. just that once 
you're f- you finished using the spy, you can then ask it, well, what were the values that were passed into you? Well, oh. was, was this method called? Yes okay. or no? And if it was called, what were the parameter values that were passed with? And so what you tend to use those for is not just directing your test down a particular path, but proving mm. that that object is used in the right way. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it sounds like they're not purely distinct concepts, but almost more like layers of functionality to be able to ask more complicated questions to them. Yeah, completely. And the the reason why I tend to talk about the difference between them, and if if you look at Amos, there actually isn't a distinction between uh, mm. stubs and spies in their implementation. They're, they're implemented exactly the same way. Gotcha. Basically, a, a stub is just a spy that you haven't asked the questions of. But, <laughs> gotcha. the, re- but the reason why you I like to talk about them as different concepts is because it helps to drive the thinking around why you're using particular bits of functionality. I think, especially when when people first start using mocking frameworks, they tend to kind of go overboard and say, (laughs) I can use this everywhere. I can can stub everything. I can mock everything. And then I've got to ask every, was every parameter passed in exactly the right way? And most of the time, you just don't need it. Most of the time, you don't need mocking at all. If I'm if I'm absolutely honest, it, it's a very particular tool for a very particular job. Mm-hmm. But when you do use it, it's very important for you to understand why you're using particular bits of functionality. And these terms help to solidify that in your mind. I think so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's a real aid aid memoir. So, as I say, stubs are very good for driving direction in tests. Then spies are very good for checking that you, that object is used in the right way. Got it. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about good unit testing, bad unit testing, a little bit of philosophy of unit testing. Let's start with kind of the bad. Like how how do you define a brutal unit test and what are some things that people can think about to avoid writing them? Okay. So a brittle unit test. I mean, that's a particular type of bad test because there are lots of different types of bad <laughs> tests. So I think we right. kind of <laughs> define what we mean by, by brittle, first of all, I guess, which is so I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about a unit test where when you start to change an area of the system, lots mm. of tests start to fail. Yeah. Yeah. And so there, there are lots of different ways in which tests can be brittle. I think there's the main one is this kind of brittleness based on dependency, which uh-huh. is the one that we, we tend to see most, I think, in Salesforce if you don't use something like, like a mocking framework. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm testing... Class A, and in order to test Class A, I need to bring in Class B, mm-hmm. and the unit test for Class A relies on the behavior of B in order to work. I can't check the behavior of A directly. Mm-hmm. I've got to interpret it by what B does, and what you then find is Class B changes cause Class A's tests to fail, and it's kind of hard to really explain that without having a piece of code in front of you but it's mm-hmm. really that that dependency brittleness comes about when everything's so intertwined and interlinked that it's very hard for you to test an individual bit without mm. needing an awful lot of other stuff of un, uh, un, untying the knot so to speak yeah so i yeah. think one of the things we we tend to think about salesforce development as being this you know it's a data processing thing isn't it we tend to mm-hmm. get data and then we we process it and then we put it somewhere right and it we tend to think of that as a fairly procedural thing and when you make that kind of procedural code what it means is i can't test that i'm doing the right things with with stuff unless i've created a lot of data at the start i right. i have to do a lot of setup and then I run my things, and then I've got to test that a lot of things happen. I think that's solid. Solid. It also brings back the loop that one way around that is a mocking framework, which provides you with a flexible yet reliable source of those presumptions, right? Yes, but it, and it also forces you to start thinking about how you draw those lines between bits. Mm-hmm. And in... That the classic sort of object-oriented development way of thinking about it, we we think about those, you know, classes should have one responsibility. They should mm-hmm. they should only do one thing, and they should do that well, and uh, they should hide their implementation from the outside world. The, these kinds of concepts are quite uh, easy to kind of talk about. Yeah, but 
they're often quite hard for you to build, especially when you you're stuck in this way of thinking about how I'm going to get data out, I'm going to process it, and then I'm going to insert it. It's very hard to see where the lines drawn between things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One of the things that we found when uh, we were using mocking frameworks back in the PHP world was that the looking for areas where you could split that dependency so that you could more easily test them mm-hmm. was actually a good way of working out where the boundaries are in your functionality and being able to abstract things in a way that makes sense. Gotcha. Because in a way, when you're you're writing these mock objects and you're writing those unit tests and you're doing it at the same time as writing your code, so doing mm-hmm. it in a test-driven development sort of way, mm-hmm. what you're kind of doing is writing the API for all of your bits as you're building the tests for them and you're building the bits all sort of at the same right. time all, and- all in the same process well let's yeah. let's let's take that one step further because you you talk about unit tests in a very specific way like test driven developments one way to think about it but it feels like you're thinking about it like that plus plus like your other talk that you've given is unit testing as documentation so define that goal for me Unit testing is documentation. Yeah, completely. That's that's something that I feel quite strongly about. And as I mm-hmm. s- I'm sure I've said before, unit tests and systems live for a long time. And the first mm-hmm. time somebody sees a unit test is normally when it's failed. And mm-hmm. really when somebody's going into a unit test in that situation, yeah. what they what they're trying to do is they're trying to find out, well, what was this class or what was this method supposed to do? Mm-hmm. that it now doesn't do. Right, right. And in that sense, the unit test is a documentation for all of the intentions that all of the previous developers have ever had for all of the methods and all of the, the classes that these unit tests exist for. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a list of, like, these were intentional decisions in terms of how this should behave. Yeah. And we really want our developers when they look at those to be able to read them and say, yes, I see what this developer intended this to do. Mm-hmm. And not just that, but I, I can see how the developer intended this to be used. And often when we're writing tests, we forget about that aspect. What we tend to think of unit tests as being for, and they absolutely are for this, they're, they're for proving that functionality exists in a particular shape. Mm-hmm. And we shouldn't dismiss that at all. That absolutely, if you that's the 100% the most important thing that unit tests are for. But if we also bring, bring into that idea that, well, people are going to have to read them and they're going to have to understand them. Mm-hmm. And they're a very particular form of code. Mm-hmm. What we, I think we really owe our future selves, we owe it to them to write our tests in a way that means that right, if I start at the top, I can see a little snapshot of what this method does. So so we would normally start start with a test that goes through the happy path and say, well, this is this is <laughs> your basic. Uh, I'm going to set this up. And if you do this, everything's right. Yeah. I should get this result. Yeah. And then we can layer on top of that sort of some other ideas. Well, actually, if I set this value to a slightly odd value, then I'm going to get this slightly odd behavior and it's going to work like this. Or if I, yeah. if I instead of giving it one record i give it 10 records it's still going to work but it's going to do this instead gotcha. and we can sort of layer that story uh-huh. into our tests uh-huh. piece by piece rather than trying to kind of blast them with all the information in one go so take take the the future developer on a little journey on how this class is supposed to behave yeah but then on, on top of that we can help them by shaping things in particular ways so that we we describe our intention within our test. We, we're expressive in our test about mm-hmm. what the behavior is. So we use very expressive variable names. Uh, we use that, that that string that's not important, actually make it say unimportant, you know, so mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. things can blend into the background when they're not important and can come to the front when they are. Uh, we shouldn't be scared of using functions to to hide setup that's not important but then we yeah. shouldn't use functions to hide setup that is important it's right. it's those kinds of little decisions which are quite different to the kinds of decisions that we make when we're writing uh the code in the rest of the system and that's our show now we will be linking to rob's material in the show notes if you would like to dig into that deeper now before we go i did ask after rob's favorite non-technical hobby and well things got complicated Ooh, no. See, I've been thinking about, about this one. I knew this question was going to come up because I have listened to previous podcasts. And nice. 
Yeah, I mean, I want to say it's either running or snowboarding. Okay. <laughs> and okay. Snow, snowboarding is a hard hobby to have in the UK during a pandemic. Oh, Don't get me wrong. It's, it's just I've not been able to do anything. Yeah. But as I was thinking about it, I think actually my biggest hobby is acquiring hobbies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I, so- tend, I tend to do is I... I find something that's going to kind of get me interested and get me excited. And it does for about six months or nine months. And then I feel like I've kind of got a handle on it. And then <laughs> I need to look for another hobby, <laughs> <laughs> which means I've got loads of hobbies that I'm really bad at. <laughs> what's What's the most recent one? Oh, uh, writing open source software. <laughs> 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 but that's technical, isn't it? <laughs> that's technical, yes. <laughs> no, I have no, got it's... into brewing beer actually. That's that's a really oh. that's a really good one. That's that's got a good payback. <laughs> you know, I am shocked that you are the first person I think my memory is correct on this. You're the first person to answer without in any context of of non-technical hobbies because there used to, there was this weird moment in like developer community evangelism where i swear every table i went to there was one person talking about their home break <laughs> and, <laughs> and i think everybody just got bored with it or something so yeah yeah i'm late to the party i want to thank rob for the great conversation and information and as always i want to thank you for listening now if you want to learn more about this show head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast where you can hear old episodes see the show notes and have links to your favorite podcast service thanks again everybody and i'll talk to you next week